you can, even as a single individual, you can change the world because your your words and actions resonate out eternal in a sense. You know, I can stand up for these things that I believe in. I can stand up. I can I can speak out, and I will be heard. I don't know about you guys, but. I'm a sucker for nostalgia, always have been. When it comes to the UFC, I love watching old fights. And for those of you who have been watching since back in the day, there's something special about seeing a sport evolve in front of your very eyes and getting to be a part of that. I started watching MMA in earnest around 2003 when there were only a handful of events a year unlike now when we're totally spoiled, but me and my friends were watching bootleg MMA tapes even before that. One of the first ones being the IFC 1, shout out to all the dinosaurs out there, when dudes would have three fights in one night, bare knuckle. When I think back to those days, a lot of names come to mind, but one especially, and that name is Evan Tanner. With his calm demeanor and kind disposition, the Texas-born fighter was a real anomaly. Evan never considered himself a fighter and had said once that he did not choose fighting, fighting chose him. In high school, Tanner won two state championships in wrestling, even though he started training relatively late. After getting his hands on some BJJ tapes, Tanner would teach himself the basics, much like Rich Franklin did. This was some real Wild West shit we're talking about here. Imagine if you would jump on YouTube and watch a few videos on how to do a rear naked and then go compete in MMA. Of course, nowadays, you'd be rewarded with a trip to the hospital, but back then, it was totally viable. After doing odd jobs for a while, Tanner was persuaded by a friend to join his first MMA tournament. So in 97, Tanner took part in the Unified Shoot Wrestling Federation 4, where he defeated three opponents in one night, winning the tournament. At USWF 7, Tanner would beat Heath Herring in a title bout for the heavyweight belt. Tanner defended that belt a total of seven times and would never officially lose it. It wouldn't take long for fight scouts to take notice of Tanner and invite him overseas to fight in Japan in the legendary Pancrase tournament. For those of you who don't know, Pancrase was founded in 93, around the same time as the UFC by professional wrestlers Funaki Masakatsu and Suzuki Minoru. In Pancrase, Palm strikes were allowed to the head and closed fists to the body, as well as kicks and knees to the body. Of course, takedowns and submissions were allowed. Also, those wrestling boots those guys used to wear were fucking badass. Notable fighters that competed in Pancrase include Uncle Chael, Boss Rutan, Akihiro Gono, Carlos Condit, Maurice Smith, Nate Diaz, the Shamrock Brothers, and Jose Aldo just to name a few. Tanner would become the first foreigner to win the Pancrase Neo Blood Tournament with two wins in one night and the third one coming a few weeks later. Tanner would be offered a title fight for the King of Pancrase against Semi Schilt as well as being offered a fight with Vanderlei Silva in the UFC at the same time with the winner fighting Frank Shamrock for the belt. Tanner would cancel both offers much to the surprise of his manager saying that he didn't think he was ready for the step up in competition. He wanted to get back into the gym to sharpen his claws before competing at that level. Beneath Tanner's stoic personality, there was a constant battle raging. Self-doubt, alcohol addiction, and depression were the main struggles Tanner had to face. And unfortunately, these things would take their toll, both physically and mentally. Tanner had always been a loner, and in his twilight hours, he would read a lot as well as putting pen to paper to express his thoughts and feelings. He was actually one of the first fighters to promote himself on MySpace and interact with fans there. In 99, Tanner would have his UFC debut at UFC 18 against Daryl Golar, winning by rear naked. He would go on to win his next two fights in the UFC, eventually getting a shot at the light heavyweight title at UFC 30. All he had to do was beat a young Tito Ortiz. Unfortunately, it didn't go so well for Tanner. Tito bear hugged Tanner and dropped him like a sack of potatoes, knocking him unconscious in the process. After knocking Tanner out, Tito used Tanner's head as a basketball and bounced it off the canvas a few times, you know, just in case that body slam didn't give him CTE. 
Tanner would bounce back and win his next four fights, but then he got matched up against Rich Franklin at UFC 42. This was Rich Franklin's UFC debut and he would not disappoint. Tanner threw some decent knees and tried to get off some dirty boxing, but Franklin's striking was just too good and he TKO'd Tanner in round one. After his loss to Franklin, Tanner would move down to middleweight. Unfortunately for Tanner though, his demons would follow. His drinking was starting to affect his relationships with his training partners at Team Quest. Tanner would show up to practice smelling like booze and sleeping on people's couches. Living out of his suitcase probably didn't help either. The consensus was that Tanner was a great guy, he just had a lot of unresolved issues. Tanner would have back-to-back -back fights with Long Island tough guy Phil Baroni, in their first fight, Tanner was blocking Baroni's punches with his face and got dropped, but somehow he managed to survive and get to the clinch. There, he connected with a few knees and eventually managed to take Baroni down, mounting him. While Tanner was massaging Baroni's face with his elbows, the ref asked Baroni if he wanted out. He either didn't hear what Baroni said or just decided that he had seen enough and stopped the fight. Baroni, who was visibly livid, immediately started protesting the stoppage. He even started throwing punches at the ref while he was still lying down. It was kind of funny seeing Dana White reprimanding Baroni while he sat on his stool looking like an angry child. In their second fight, there was no controversy. Tanner wasted no time getting to the clinch, throwing multiple knees to the body, taking Baroni down almost at will and doing damage. Even during the stand-up, Tanner was the more active, with Baroni taking a more cautious approach. In the end, Brony gassed, but he did try to rally in round three, landing a few good shots. Ultimately, it wasn't enough, and Tanner won via decision. At UFC 50, Tanner faced a very young Robbie Lawler with hair. Lawler went for a takedown, slamming Tanner on the canvas, but Tanner immediately locked up a triangle choke, winning the fight. Tanner was now 9-2 in the UFC and was offered a shot at middleweight gold. David Terrell, who at the time was considered to be very hot shit, coming off a KO of Matt Lindland as well as being a Gracie black belt, would be Tanner's opponent. Terrell went for a guillotine early on, but Tanner managed to escape and obtain top position. There he just started to beat on Terrell with elbows and punches. After Terrell tried the play dead strategy for a few minutes, Herb Dean stepped in and stopped the fight. Not bad for a guy who taught himself BJJ watching tapes, beating a Gracie black belt like that. Tanner had now reached the high point of his career, finally obtaining UFC gold. Tanner's success would be short-lived though because Rich Franklin would be his first title defense when he moved down to middleweight. Tanner's stand-up was never anything to write home about and in this fight, he was forced into a kickboxing match with Rich Franklin, never getting a chance to initiate the clinch. And when they did clinch, it was Franklin who threw the knees. Franklin methodically picked Tanner apart with punches and kicks for four rounds until the fight was stopped by the ringside doctor. Tanner's loss to Franklin would signal the beginning of a downward spiral as he lost his next three out of four fights. He would also have a falling out with the boys over at Team Quest because of money or Tanner's drinking. He would bounce around gyms for a while until he decided he was going to convert his house into a gym where he would take in disenfranchised athletes. But for some reason or another, the plan fell apart. Tanner's girlfriend of many years decided to move on, causing him to hit the bottle even harder. At this point, Tanner started to doubt if he could even compete at the highest level anymore. Tanner decided that in order to get his life back on track, he would need to do some serious soul searching. So he decided to go on a trip. Unbeknownst to Tanner though, it would be his last. In 2008, Tanner went on a trip to the California desert in Imperial County. He packed his motorbike full of supplies and headed out setting up camp somewhere west of Palo Verde. What exactly happened is a little unclear, but from what I could gather, Tanner intended to walk from his campsite to a place called Clap Springs a few clicks away to refill his water bottles. 
But what Tanner didn't realize was that besides having a very misleading name, Clap Springs was also completely dry. I don't know if any of you have ever been in the desert, but in 118 degrees or 40 plus Celsius, you go through water like Hunter Biden goes through fucking crack. Tanner sent a friend a text message that he was at Clap Springs and was going to wait for nightfall to head back to camp. The idea being traveling at night wouldn't be as grueling and if he wouldn't hear from him by morning, he should contact the authorities. That message was sent on September 4th. Next morning came and nothing. A search party was sent out and on September 8th, four days after Tanner sent the initial message, his body was found. Cause of death? Heat exposure. The search team had concluded that Tanner had probably been without water for three whole days. A lot of people online speculated that it was a suicide mission, that Tanner went out there to die, but I don't buy that bullshit. Yes, Tanner had issues, but after watching dozens of interviews and reading some of his blogs, I never once got the sense that he wanted to off himself. The dude was a fighter, in every sense of the word. In my opinion, he just fell victim to poor planning and a few bad decisions. When they found his phone, the last message Tanner tried to send but couldn't due to bad cell coverage was, I need help. Evan Tanner isn't someone that pops up in a lot of conversations these days, and if you were to compare his skill set to today's talent, he probably would be considered very basic. But it still does not change the fact that he was one of the trailblazers of this sport. His top game was very good for a guy that was basically self-taught, making good use of elbows in a time when that wasn't too common. And he was one of the first guys to utilize dirty boxing and knees in the UFC. And for a guy that didn't even consider himself a fighter, winning a UFC title isn't half bad. He was complex and flawed, and that's what made him relatable in my opinion. Everyone loves a redemption arc, and Evan Tanner had that. His legacy can still be felt in the UFC today, and even though you're gone, you're not forgotten.